And I'm so thankful that God is in charge of all things. You look around the world today and you see what's taking place and sometimes you wonder if God is still on the throne. Folks, I'm here to tell you today that His kingdom rules and reigns forever and ever. And if you are a saved person, you are a Christian, a blood-washed saint, you are a part of the kingdom of God. And His kingdom is ruling. And I'm so thankful to be a part of what God is doing here at Clearwater Christian College. I'm glad that my airplane made it in yesterday. I am so sorry that I wasn't here, but I was stuck on the ground in Kansas City with a bunch of ice and a bunch of snow. As a matter of fact, when I got on the airplane in Kansas City, it was still snowing. The, the runway was covered with snow, but I guess snow's not a problem as long as there's not ice. And so I was able to make it down here. And let me tell you, it was a breath of fresh air to step off of the airplane in Tampa, Florida. Let me tell you. The nice, warm weather it was unbelievable, and I'm so glad to be a part of what God's doing here this week, and I trust that God will use us, not just the messages, but I hope that you will see in our lives that we just want to be real, genuine people. We're just trying to serve the Lord. God has called you to this place. God has called us to the ministry of evangelism, and we trust that our lives and ministry will be a special blessing to you this week. I'm sorry that my wife is not able to be here. Her name is Amy. Both Mike and I married girls named Amy, and I have two girls named Megan and Madison. Of course, Mike has Micah, Malachi, Michaela, and McKenna. And so if you can get all that straight, you are definitely doing well in school. And I'm so glad to see you. We want you to know that we're available for you throughout the week. Uh, I am actually going to be staying right on campus over there in the apartment. I believe it's even at the end of the girls' dormitory. I don't know how that worked, but uh, I'm at, in the apartment down there. And so if you'd like to talk, if there's anything we can do to help you this week, we want to be a blessing to you. You will see us around, and uh, we'll be in and out of different places. And we trust that uh, you'll come right up to us if there's something we can do. Hopefully we'll get to meet many of you. Obviously, it's a large crowd. We won't be able to get meet, to meet everybody throughout the week. But uh, we definitely are looking forward to what God's going to teach us throughout the week. Take your Bibles this morning and turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. I know you had a good start yesterday. I was talking to my brother Mike. He said it was tremendous to see the response and the different decisions that were made. And I trust that you will live out a right philosophy of life. A powerful, passionate philosophy. You know, there's all kinds of wicked philosophies out there. And the, the world is trying to press us down with those philosophies, humanism, hedonism, materialism, postmodernism, relativism, and I could go on and on with all these different isms. It is absolutely essential in Christian colleges that, today that we have young people that know how to live for God. That we have young people who have a biblical philosophy of life and of ministry. We're going to look at another passage of Scripture this morning that was written by the same author. We looked in Philippians yesterday. Today we're looking to the book of 2 Timothy. Obviously, the Apostle Paul is writing this book of the Bible, and once again, he's in prison. Everywhere he went, he was in prison. He wouldn't look for the nicest motel when he'd go to a town. He'd look for the nicest prison because he knew he'd be there anyways. And Paul was being persecuted, thrown into jail, and here is his final exhortation. He is in prison in Rome, probably a lot different than Philippi. In Philippi, he was in some sort of a house arrest. In Rome, he's actually in the dungeon. And he knows that this is his final hour. How do we know that? Because he says at the end of this book, I have fought a good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. You know what? Many times I've thought to myself, I hope that I'll be able to say that at the end of my life. But Paul, this man who was persecuting Christians and God converted him and made him into a preacher to Christians, he writes this book to young Timothy. He picked up Timothy on his second missionary journey in the city of Lystra because Timothy was a young person that had a good testimony. Can you imagine traveling with the Apostle Paul? must have been an incredible opportunity for this young man, Timothy, to be mentored and moved by the Apostle Paul. Paul said he watched his manner of life, his doctrine, his teaching. He went different places with him. And finally, Paul actually entrusted Timothy and sent him to different places like Corinth and Philippi and Thessalonica. And so Timothy was a special young man. And he comes to Timothy and he's writing his final exhortation as if to say, Timothy, I'm going to be dead and gone, but here's what you need to learn. Here's what you need as my final exhortation. 2 Timothy chapter 2, we'll start reading in verse 1. It says this, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him, to be a soldier. Two different times in this short passage of four verses, he pleads with young Timothy to be a good soldier for Jesus Christ. 
This morning, the message is four marks of a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Would you bow your heads as we open the message in a word of prayer? Father, I pray that you will speak to our hearts this morning from this powerful text written from a martyr, the Apostle Paul, who just months after he finished this passage was beheaded for the cause of Christ. Lord, thank You for the way He led. Thank You for the way He has guided us through the Scripture and the inspiration of Scripture. He has given us His example to follow. And He said, follow Me as I follow Christ. And Lord, as we learn about this exhortation to young Timothy, may it be an exhortation to all of us that we might stand up in the midst of the battle that is going on, the battle that is raging with the world, the flesh, and the devil, and that we might claim the promises of God and be a good soldier for Jesus Christ. Father, I pray for the young people here the college students at Clearwater Christian College, Lord, I pray that out of this place you will raise up an army of of Christian servants that will go out from this place and make a difference in our culture for Jesus Christ. Father, do the work this morning through Your Word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. There's no question that soldiers impact people. There's no question that soldiers are distinctively different and making a difference all around the world. You can't watch the news. You can't pick up the newspaper today. You can't pick up any news magazine on the shelf without seeing something about the soldiers that are serving our country over in Iraq. As a matter of fact, how many of you know somebody that right now is overseas serving our country? How many of you know somebody like that? Wow, look at all the hands going up. Our president has just switched the strategy and he's sending over more troops. Whether you like his strategy or not, you have to admit that we ought to pray and support the American soldier. Amen? We ought to stand for what, uh, what they're doing over there. And I'm so thankful that we have men and women who are making an impact. What does a soldier do? A soldier salutes a commander. And a soldier fights for a good cause. Now, the commander that they're fighting for is the President of the United States, George W. Bush, the commander-in-chief. But the commander that you and I serve as Christian soldiers is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Yes, they have a commander. And yes, they have a cause. And I'm thankful to be an American, aren't you? I've had the privilege of going over all, uh, many different countries around the world. I've been in Europe. I've been to the Far East. I've been to the Philippines. I've been to Singapore. But let me tell you, folks, you're living in the greatest country in all the world. And we ought to say, God bless America. It is a great cause, the, the cause of freedom around the world that we are fighting for right now. But let me tell you some folks. I live in the greatest country, and I'm so thankful for America. But there is something more important than America. And that is the cause of Jesus Christ. And a soldier salutes his commander, that's our God, and a soldier fights for a good cause. And that cause is the cause of Jesus Christ in this wicked world. The Bible says we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, be ye reconciled unto God. God wants every young person in this room to be a good Christian soldier. God wants you to go out of this place, this little boot camp, this little basic training time, because that's what Christian college really is. And when you hit the battlefield, you ought to do something for God. You ought to impact someone for Christ. You ought to impact a local church. And God wants that to take place in your life. How does that happen? Well, it doesn't happen unless you have four characteristics, four marks of a good soldier in your life. Number one, he tells us in verse number one, Thou therefore, my son, what a powerful statement, a personal statement. Paul said to Timothy, you're my son in the faith. Probably got saved on his first missionary journey in Lystra. Then he picked him up on his second missionary journey as a teenager. And he says, thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. The first characteristic of a good soldier is a good soldier must Be strong. Have you ever noticed that our soldiers aren't weaklings? We're not sending over a bunch of couch potatoes over there. We're sending out over the most fit people in our culture. As a matter of fact, if you've ever seen them go through boot camp basic training, if you've ever seen some of the special forces in their training, you can't tell me that the American soldier isn't strong. You get up here with an American soldier and say, give me 25 push-ups, that'd be no problem at all. He'd give you 50. He'd give you 100. He'd go out and run his miles. He could do those calisthenics. Why? Because soldiers are strong. They're building themselves physically for the cause of our country. And in the same way, Paul tells Timothy that we ought to be exercising ourselves unto godliness. Bodily exercise profits little, but godliness is profitable in all things. Paul uses an interesting word here when he says to be strong. It's the same word that's used in Philippians 4.13. And where Christ strengtheneth us, It's the same word he uses in chapter 1, verse 16, I believe it is. In in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 16, where he says, Christ hath enabled me 
and counted me faithful, putting me in the ministry. Here's what the word be strong literally means. It means to be empowered by God. It is an imperative, but it's in the passive sense. In other words, the subject is being acted upon. It means to allow God to strengthen us. It means to allow God to empower our lives. You know, I believe because of the charismatic movement, we have shied away from talking about the power of God upon our lives. Let me tell you something, folks, this morning. Without God's power, you and I are, uh, are doing nothing good for the cause of Christ. Nothing profitable will take place just because you're talented. Nothing profitable will take place just because you have a bunch of abilities and maybe you can do some things. Nothing profitable comes apart from God's power on our life. And as a good Christian soldier stepping out onto the battlefield, we must be powered by God. We must be strong as a good soldier. Where does this strength come from? This strength comes from two different places. Obviously, first of all, the Word of God. The Bible says in Hebrews 4, verse 12, for the Word of God is quick and, what's the next word? Powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing, dividing asunder the soul and spirit of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Folks, I'm glad to declare to you today that the book we are looking at has supernatural power. The Bible says it's like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. And I've had the precious privilege of preaching this, uh, this uh, Bible all across this world. And folks, the power is not in the preacher. The power is in what is preached. And it's the Word of God that is powerful. Psalm 119, verse 9 says, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. With my whole heart have I sought thee, O let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against God. Jeremiah 15, 16 says, Thy word was found, and I did eat it, and it became the joy and rejoicing of my soul. It is a tragic state when we have Christian college students who do not treasure the word of God. When you leave this Bible college, one of the things that should be on the forefront of your mind is that there is power in God's Word. You've seen it in chapel. You've seen it in your Bible classes. You've seen it on extension. You've seen it at different places around this community as you have impacted others with the powerful Word of God. Folks, God is looking for soldiers who will carry the serious weapon called the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. You know what? We ought to be memorizing it. We ought to know what God says. This book is powerful. It's powerful to give you victory. It's powerful to give uh, you victory in your personal life and on the battlefield for the Lord. And the only way we're going to defeat the devil is with the Word of God. Jesus did in Matthew chapter 4 when He was tempted. When He was tempted of the devil, He said, It is written. How in the world are we going to be successful apart from God's strength, God's power, allowing His Word to enable us? Empowered by the Word of God. Let me ask you a question. Are you spending time with God? Well, I know you're at a Bible college, and sometimes I remember, because I went to Bible college as well, sometimes I, I used to excuse myself and say, well, I'm going to Bible class, and I've got chapel almost every day, and I'm going to church. Surely that's enough. You listen, folks, we need to desperately de be dependent on God's Word personally. We need to know what God says, and we need to live what God says. I like to say it this way. You've got to love it, you've got to learn it, you've got to live it. God's Word has the supernatural power to strengthen you in the battle. But it doesn't come just through the Word of God. The Word of God is called the sword of the Spirit. And it's absolutely essential that we talk about the Spirit of God. Now, the Bible clearly teaches that when you and I get saved, who comes and lives in our body? The Holy Spirit. You know, there are people out there that say, well, you've got to get the second blessing of the Spirit. Listen, when you and I got saved, we got the whole blessing. Amen. 100% of the Spirit of God came and indwelled your body. Indwelt your body. The Bible says you are literally baptized by the Spirit. You are totally immersed by the Spirit of God. So the question is not, if you're saved, the question is not whether He's in you because He is. The question is, who's controlling you? Who's strengthening you? The Bible says in Ephesians 5.18, And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled, controlled by the Spirit. A parallel passage is given to us in Colossians 3.16 where it says, Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. All right? So God uses the Word of God and the Spirit of God to strengthen our lives. How can we allow the Spirit of God to strengthen us? Well, first of all, we need to abide in Him. John 15 says, Abide in Him as the branch abides in the vine. So should we be abiding in the Lord. That means we've got to spend time with God. We need to have a personal relationship with Him. We're not just walking through the Christian life, just kind of floating along. No, we're getting to know our God. We're spending time with Him on a regular basis. And then we need to ask Him to fill us. We need to ask the Spirit of God 
to control our lives, to strengthen us. You know what? I believe it should be a regular prayer of a Christian college student. Lord, today, I need your strength in my life. I need you to control my decisions. I need you to control what I say. I need you to control my attitude when things don't go my way. And all those things are direct reflections of who is strengthening your life. You'll either be strengthened by the flesh or you'll be strengthened by the Spirit. So we abide in Him. We ask Him to fill us and then we allow Him to control our lives. That means you ought to listen to Him. When you're sitting in chapel and the Holy Spirit of God ministers to your heart with conviction. Has that ever happened? I hope that happens on a regular basis. Listen, folks, you ought to love good preaching. You ought to love coming to chapel. You ought to love it. Why? Because that's where the Spirit of God uses the Word of God to strengthen you. And when you're overwhelmed with conviction, what do you do about it? Do you submit to the Spirit or do you say no to the Spirit? It's one of the ways you can tell who is really strengthening your life. So the strength of a good Christian soldier comes from the Word of God and the Spirit of God. Both are absolutely essential in your lives. And young person, I'm here to tell you, you'll never make an impact in this culture if you don't have God's power on your life. It is something I plead for every day. It's something I pray for. It's something I'm working for. And I'm so glad we sang all the songs that we sang today because here's the reality. Lord, we need You. We desperately need You. Nothing good happens apart from the strength of our commander, the strength of God upon our lives. The first characteristic of a good soldier is to be strong. To be empowered by God as a good Christian soldier. Look down in verse 2. Remember, all of us need to be good Christian soldiers. This isn't just for a few. We're not just looking for a few good men. We're looking for everybody in here. Everybody in here to take up the challenge, to hold up the flag, and to do something for God. To salute their commander and fight for a greater cause than themselves. Number one, you've got to be strong. But look at verse 2. He says, And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, or literally entrust these things to other faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Timothy had the special privilege of traveling with Paul and learning all about the ministry through one of the greatest servants of the Lord. But now what is Paul telling Timothy? He's saying, Timothy, the same thing that I entrusted to you, now I want you to take and entrust to somebody else. He says, I don't care how you do it. I don't care when you do it, but you ought to be doing it. You know what he's talking about here? He's talking about being a servant to somebody else. Here's the second characteristic of a good soldier. Number one, be strong. Number two, be serving. Be serving. You know, one of the things that you notice about soldiers when they leave this country and go over on the battlefield is they care. They care about the other soldiers. You know, one guy falls by the wayside, one guy gets shot in his leg. They don't just walk by and let him lay there, no. They are literally risking their lives to save the other brothers, the other people that are out there on the battlefield. And they will die for, their, uh, for other people on the battlefield. I was just reading a story recently about, about a guy who was a Navy SEAL, one of the greatest soldiers in the world. He was in a little bunker with five other, uh, four other Navy SEALs, a total of five of them. And, and lo and behold, an Iraqi came by and threw a grenade into their bunker. And without even hesitating, that young man, that Navy SEAL, took his entire body and covered up the grenade so that the other four SEALs could walk out. He took the entire force of the grenade. Why? Because he cared about those other four SEALs, those other four soldiers. Boy, that is a common story that can be told on the battlefield. Why? Because soldiers care about other soldiers. Soldiers are serving. Paul's telling Timothy, listen, don't be selfish with what I entrusted you with. Be a servant. I like that. Don't be selfish. Be a servant. Say that with me. Don't be selfish. Be a servant. And specifically in this passage, he's talking about multiplying yourself. You know what he's talking about here? He's talking about the same thing Jesus talked about in the Great Commission. He's talking about being a disciple maker. You know, a lot of Christian college students come to college and they're always looking for somebody to mentor them. Guess what? God wants you to mentor somebody else. God wants you to find an underclassman. God wants you to find somebody in the community. God wants you to lead somebody to Christ and show them the way of Christ to entrust to them the things that you've been entrusted with. And yet we come to college many times and we think about our time. We think about our treasure. We think about all kinds of things that have everything to do with us and we're not really ministering to other people. 
We can minister to people by sharing the gospel. We can minister to people by helping them along in their Christian life. Sometimes one of the greatest ways to minister to somebody is to confront them in their sin with a loving Christ-like spirit to help them. The Bible says, "Ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. And yet we have a bunch of young people who have grown up thinking it's always wrong to talk to somebody about their sin. Listen, we ought to be helping people. We ought to be serving the Lord. I'll tell you who the greatest person in this room is. It's not the person who scores the points on the, on the basketball, volleyball, court, or soccer field. The greatest person in this room is not the valedictorian, the 4.0 student, the person who's doing well in school. The greatest person in this room, and the person, by the way, that will be remembered at Clearwater Christian College. The person that will be remembered at this place is a person who is going out and serving other people. Serving their, the, the fellow students, making disciples, coming alongside of people and helping them in their walk with Christ. That is the greatest person in this room. And by the way, if you learn to serve in college, you'll continue to serve as a full-time servant. No matter what job you do, no matter what occupation, you will get so excited, you will have such joy in serving the Lord, that you will be a full-time servant of the Lord for the rest of your life. You know why I know that? Because the Bible clearly teaches that we are happy when we serve other people. We get this idea, well, everybody needs to serve me, and that surely is the best way to live when everybody's given to me. You know what? The Bible says it's more blessed to give than to receive. Stop just receiving and start giving out. Don't be selfish. Be a servant. And you know, I may be looking at a crowd of young people and a, and a whole host of you have very rarely ever thought about anybody that you can serve. Maybe it's in the dorm room. Maybe it's here on campus. And you don't care about anybody else. You just want to have your stuff. You want to have your time. Don't bother me. Let me tell you something. You'll never be greatly used on the battlefield for Jesus Christ. Unless you get your eyes off of yourself and get your eyes on others. Others, Lord, yes, others. Let this my motto be, help me to live for others. And let me tell you something, young people, the greatest joy you can have in this life is to give your life to God and serve other people. Find somebody to disciple. Find somebody that you can mentor. Find somebody that you can bring alongside and help them out in their Christian life. That's what good soldiers always do. Soldiers are serving. Be strong. Be strong. Number two, be serving. Now look down in verse 3 and he says this, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Flip back to 1 Timothy chapter or, or chapter 1 verse 8. It's just one chapter back. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 8. These two verses are the only two verses that use this specific, specific Greek word. It literally means to suffer alongside of someone. It means to suffer together with. Verse 8 says this, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me as prisoner, but, here's the same word, be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel. What is Paul telling Timothy? Paul is telling Timothy to be steadfast through trials. And he's telling him to suffer along with him. Obviously, Paul can talk about this because he was one of the most persecuted people ever to live. He was thrown in prison, stoned, left for dead, shipwrecked. All kinds of things took place in his life. But he said, like the Bible clearly teaches, that those infirmities were for the pleasure of God and for the power of God upon our lives. Doesn't the Bible say, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and them are called according to His purpose. And so I would love to stand up here today and say that if you surrender to God and you become this kind of a soldier, you're strong in the Lord, the Word of God and the Spirit of God is powering you, and you want to do something in other people's lives, and you want to serve other people, I would love to tell you that it's going to be easy the whole time. I would love to tell you that there's not going to be any trials. I would love to tell you that there'll never be people that shoot you in the back and stab you in the back. I'd love to tell you that there'll never be any persecutions. But doesn't the Bible say, all that live godly shall suffer? If you're not suffering, let me tell you something. You're probably not living the kind of godly life you ought to be living. Now, I'm not saying, you know, bullets are flying, people punching you in the face. I'm saying if you're not getting some sort of a little bit of ridicule, even in a Christian college, then you're probably not standing like you ought to be standing. You ought not look for persecution. It'll come your way. I remember when I was a Bible college student, I was out on the soccer field. And uh, there was Matt Mark and Mike Herbster. We were playing on the soccer team. I was a freshman. My brother Matt, I believe, was a junior at the time. He had already kind of set the precedent for us, I guess. And I was out on the, on the soccer field, and I remember I picked up one of our society's soccer balls. We were just in intramural sports there, and I, and I remember they picked up, picked up one of the uh, society soccer balls, and somebody from another team had taken a pen, and they would written all over the ball, they had written this. They had written, the Herbster Trinity. You can't lose. You got the Trinity. 
And I thought to myself, what in the world is this? They're blaspheming God and they're making fun of us. And I took that ball over to my older brother, Matt, and I said, what in the world is this? And he gave me some great advice. He said, Mark, just get used to it. You try to live for God, and sometimes those things are going to happen. Just get over it. You know what? You're going to have to have a thick hide if you're ever going to live for God as a Christian soldier. I'm so glad right now we got soldiers in America who aren't thrown in the town, man. They're walking right into the battle. And yet we have Christian young people all across this country. Christian young people right in this room. And you can't stand up for Jesus Christ even in a Christian college. Let me tell you something. You'll never make it on the battlefield if you can't do what's right here and be steadfast for the cause of Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of of the Lord. Are you steadfast? Are you standing up for righteousness? Are you speaking out? Are you wanting to be counted for the cause of Christ? If I were to mention your name to classmates, if I were to mention your name to to staff members, would they say, man, there's a student that they're going to love God, they're going to serve God, boy, they're doing something for God. Would they say that about you? Would they say, well, they're kind of a little bit cold, they're a little bit callous, they're a little bit on the edge, they're on the fringe. Listen, we need some soldiers to stand up and be counted for Jesus Christ. Be strong. Be serving. Be steadfast. And then finally, verse 4 says this, No man that warreth, no soldier who is enlisted in battle and going to battle, no man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs, the business, the ideas of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. What's he talking about here? Well, he's talking about the same thing that happens when a soldier leaves his family. Have you seen this on on the television? It is one of the saddest things I've ever seen. I remember just about a year ago, I was standing out in San Diego and watching a boat pass by and a bunch of people lined up on the side waving, waving at this Navy vessel as they were going out, uh, out to sea over to Iraq. And it was sad to me to see the little kids, to see the moms, to see the different family members there, tears streaming down their face. Listen, when you're a soldier, you're not a civilian anymore. And you don't get entangled with the civilian things. Listen, that, that is not their business anymore. Their business is to serve their commander and fight for a good cause. And that's what he's talking about here. He says we're willing to leave the civilian life and become a soldier for Jesus Christ. He says we're not entangling ourselves with the affairs of this life. As a matter of fact, a good Christian soldier, a good American soldier, they all wear the same uniform. And you know what? They're not embarrassed about it. I love seeing them in the airport. I love going up to them and just telling them how much I appreciate their service for our country. They pack all their stuff in a knapsack. They put it all in these big bags. They they all look the same. They dress the same. And they leave the affairs of this life behind. Why? Because they want to win the war. And here's what Paul is saying to Timothy. Timothy, you've got to be willing to leave anything and everything out of your life that is not going to help you in the battle. Don't get entangled with the world. Don't get entangled with the affairs of this life. Listen to what the Bible says. James 4, verse 4. Friendship with the world is enmity with God. One of the worst things that could ever happen in our lives is that we have become such a friend of the world that our commander-in-chief, God Almighty, would say, you're not a good soldier because you're my enemy now. You see, the world is our enemy. The Bible says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And so God is telling us to come out and be separate. Be strong, be serving, be steadfast, and number four, be separate. Be separate. You know what? We're living in a Christian culture today that is not separate from the world. We're in the world, but we're not supposed to be of the world. And listen, I know it's tough. I know it's hard because we're not just fighting against contemporary culture. We're fighting against contemporary Christianity. And it is an uphill battle all the time. But listen, we ought not be embarrassed to wear the uniform of our commander. Where do you go to school? Well, you don't want to tell somebody where you go to school. Where do you go to church? Are you a Christian? You know, sometimes, literally, we go out into this culture in this wicked day, and we don't want anybody to know that we're a little bit different than them. Why not? I'll tell you why. Because we're not really the kind of soldiers we ought to be for Jesus Christ. I'm not saying you've got to be weird. I'm not saying that you, you can't minister to people in this culture. I'm saying that we ought to be willing to be different from the world. A peculiar people zealous for good works. Why? Because we are pilgrims and strangers passing through. This world's not our home. We're just a passing through. Our treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. And folks, I believe we had a lot of people living in Christian culture today who are become familiar and citizens of this culture when they're supposed to not be civilians. They're supposed to be on the battlefield for Jesus Christ. Don't be entangled with the affairs of this life. Come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. Listen, every 
young person in this room, every college student in this room, every adult in this room, including this preacher, we need good Christian soldiers. How does it happen? We've got to be strong, be serving, be steadfast, and be separate from sin, and we can be the kind of soldier that makes a difference. Because soldiers impact people, and there's nothing more that these staff members want than this Christian college wants than to send out the graduates of Clearwater Christian College to do something great for God. But you've got to be a good soldier, and it starts now. Sometimes you have this idea, well, later I'll serve God. Well, when I get out, let me just have a little bit of fun now. Just let me sow my wild oats a little bit. Listen, if you don't serve God in a Christian college, it may not ever happen. Right now is the time for you to be this kind of soldier, strengthened by the power of God, serving other people, getting your eyes off of yourself, standing strong in the midst of a wicked culture, and even standing strong with peers and people here at this school, and then coming out and being separate from sin and separate from the world. This is what a Christian soldier really looks like. One of my heroes in the last four years has been a man that I met many, many years ago as a little junior high student. I met our governor of the state of Missouri. His name is John Ashcroft. If you ever heard the name, you obviously remember that John Ashcroft lost his Senate race about, about six uh, years ago. He lost his Senate race to a dead man who won the Senate in the state of Missouri, and actually his wife, the dead man's wife, took the position. It was a terrible, tragic day in the state of Missouri, but nonetheless, God was working for good because just a few weeks later, as he records in his book, Never Again, just a few weeks later, John Ashcroft got a phone call from the President of the United States to be the Attorney General of the United States of America. As I was reading through his book just recently, it was unbelievable to see how this man, though he wasn't on the battlefield, he really was on the battlefield. He wasn't wearing all the fatigues, but he sure was being a good soldier in American culture. Unbelievable the things he had to go through, the strength of God that had to be upon his life. He is a born-again believer as well. And the service that he gave to our country as he has been fighting terrorism here and around the world. And I'm glad to tell you, and he is glad to tell you, that in the four years that he was the Attorney General of the United States of America, there was not one terrorist attack, and yet many, many terrorists have been incarcerated and put into prison and sent out out of this country. And I'm so thankful that we have soldiers like that, like Attorney General John Ashcroft, and soldiers who are on the battlefield, real soldiers, who the bullets are flying, that are standing for our country. But that's what we need for our Lord Jesus Christ. We need soldiers who are willing to be strong, serving, steadfast, and separate. Can I ask you a question? Will you enlist? Will you be the kind of soldier that makes a difference, that makes an impact for the cause of Jesus Christ? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? How many of you say this morning, Brother Mark, God spoke to my heart. God spoke to my heart. I I realize today that there's something that is preventing me from being that kind of servant, that kind of soldier. God spoke to me about being powered by the Spirit. God spoke to me about being a servant, coming out from the sin and the culture and being separate. Maybe it's standing up and speaking out for righteousness. You say, Brother Mark, just with an uplifted hand, I want to tell you that God has spoken to my heart and God's doing something in my heart right now. If that's you, just lift your hand high in the air. Thank you. Praise the Lord. I see many hands across the building. You may put them back down. I hope it's reflective of a genuine heart and a genuine change that needs to take place. Right now, as we just quietly wait for about 30 seconds, I want you to just call out to God if you want to get on your knees. You can do that as well, but right now, as we just quietly wait, if you lifted your hand, or maybe you didn't, just talk to God right now for about 30 seconds, and just tell Him specifically what needs to change so that you can be the kind of soldier that pleases God. Father, thank you so much for the power of the Word of God. Thank you for speaking to hearts this morning. And I pray with all of my heart for the young people here, the college students at Clearwater Christian College. Father, I pray you'll raise up an army of soldiers out of this place. If we can't get Christian college students to be this kind of a person, this kind of a soldier for the cause of Christ, Lord, where are they going to come from? Father, I pray that we won't back up or slack up, that we will stand for Jesus Christ. 
in this wicked day. That we will fight the devil, we'll fight the world, and we'll fight our wicked flesh. And we know that you can give us the victory because you've said, but thanks be unto God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for speaking to our hearts today. Continue to challenge us. Continue to move us, Father, so that we can make a difference in the lives of people and live out a true, genuine gospel in front of the eyes of other people around us. Continue to work. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.